Uh, next interview is with Ron Cozy of uh, Old Editions. And Ron, you're up in Buffalo, correct? That's correct. Um, let's get started by finding something about your background, uh, where you grew up, your family, what your parents did, you have siblings, uh, etc. Take us up through college or high school. Okay, well, I was born in the southern tier, what they call the southern tier, tier uh, which is down near the Pennsylvania border. Grew up on a farm till I was seven years old, and my father got a job up in the city of Buffalo. So we left the farm, and I grew up in uh, the suburbs of Buffalo. Went to high school there, and uh, later on went to <coughs> Bryan and Stratton Business Institute in Buffalo. I've got uh, three brothers and a sister, and uh, my mom is still living. She's 89 years old. Are any of your siblings have any interest in books? No, not really. My uh, uh, grandson is going to medical school. Uh, my daughter lives in California. I have three grandkids, and my wife has, I have two stepchildren with my wife, and uh, they like to play hockey. Oh, yeah, I love hockey, too. Uh, tell me a little bit about when you first got bitten by the book bug. Well, it kind of happened in high school. I uh, started playing on the chess team, and uh, I looked around and found out about the Buffalo Chess Club and started hanging out down there and playing chess, and uh, um, I carried it to a pretty high amateur level. I later became... New York State amateur chess champion, and right. I played chess with Bobby Fischer. And, oh, wow. Uh, won 17 chess tournaments, and but it was all on an amateur level. I didn't uh, turn professional. And uh, after business school, I went to work at the post office <laughs> but um, as an accountant. But um, uh, what happened is I got the idea of becoming a chess book dealer. Huh. I used to go to New York and meet with some of the top people down there, Walter Goldwater, for example, yeah. was like a mentor to me. I'd go see him every year, and he would help me build my chess book collection. He, Walter, was the president of the Marshall Chess Club and also an ABAA uh, bookseller. Oh, yeah. And um, I started branching out from there. Well, well, when you say chess books, is this something that you still do or? Well, I built a large collection of 5,000 rare chess wow. books. Uh, from Walter, I bought the first Italian chess book, 1512. And I used to go to the Morgan to see the first book ever printed in England, which is The Game and Play of Chess mm. by Caxton. The only copy that I know of in the United States is at the Morgan. And uh, I was just fascinated with early chess and early printing. and. Uh, I still am. It's my hobby. But um, I branched off. I, I got a job in Buffalo working part-time at Thomas Mahoney's place. I know Tom. Be later became Mahoney and Weekly. And uh, uh, Tom Mahoney was like my mentor and got me started in the book business. He said, forget that post office. He said, you'll have more fun in the book business. <laughs> well, so I right. did. <laughs> I did. And he was right. When did you open your uh, first shop? Uh, my first full-time shop was in 76, November of 76. How long did you work for Tom Mahoney? I worked for him for about five years. And, so and he's the one who said to me one day, we were having breakfast one day, he said, Ron, you're ready. And I said, ready for what? He said, you're ready to have your own shop. <laughs> wow. So he really helped me out. That was nice of him to do that. So he sort of pushed you in the right direction. Yeah, he did. He opened up a lot of doors for me and uh, took me with him to meet a lot of colleagues, and I met a lot of distinguished booksellers and got to know them. So those are some of your early recollections in the, in the trade. Who were some of the people other than Walter Goldwater and Tom Mahoney that, that sort of uh, had some influence on you as a bookseller? Well, Peter Krause uh, from Ursus Books. His wife was from Buffalo, oh, and he that. was in Buffalo, and... Uh, my shop, and he uh, encouraged me to uh, be, join the ABAA, yeah. and uh, I did. Let me t talk a little bit now about the internet. Um, are you an internet bookseller? Do you have yes. a presence? Yes, we have been for many years. Uh, how did you find your transition from uh, being a bookseller to being an internet bookseller? Was it an easy transition or a difficult one for you? Well, it was not difficult. It's um, 
You know, a lot of people don't like change. I don't particularly like change. You get comfortable with doing things a certain way. But you also have to realize you have to adapt if you want to continue to stay in business. Yeah. I mean, um, I moved my shop five times until the, the fourth time I bought a building, a 3,000 square foot first floor with apartments upstairs, and, and that's the shop that uh, I occupied for 20 years from uh, 84 till uh, 2002. And in 95, we got our first computer and we got on the internet and my wife has helped me. She's like our office manager, mm -hmm. and she has been a great help in the shop. Uh, and then I've had some great employees, young people on the way up mm -hmm. that you pick up and help you along the way, and then, you know, they move on. And uh, um, we transitioned pretty well. Um, um, as a matter of fact, at the last place we're in now, it's, it was a warehouse. I bought it as a warehouse, but it's a warehouse open to the public because we realize that everything's going on the internet. So we've got four floors. The upper two floors are warehouse, and uh, the second floor is like our collector's room and rare book room. And the first floor is our bookshop. We added a little cafe to try mm -hmm. to bring in yeah. the money stream. So we've got, um, uh, we're, we're a warehouse open to the public. And it looks like a warehouse, and uh, but we're in the downtown area of Buffalo, and um, uh, so we have people coming in to buy in the shop. <clears throat> we have our internet, we have uh, um, show activity, and then uh, I participate in book auctions. So I've got those four different revenue sources to bring us up to today. Do you do you, when you see you participate in book auctions? Do you run them? No, no, I I. I try to send a certain number of material right, to auction every year, so uh, to try to balance what keep, we keep have. Keep the money coming in. Try, totally. Yeah, exactly. It's an effort to try to keep enough cash flow. We uh, One time I had nine people on our payroll. We're down to three full-time and two part-time because of the way the economy is. What kind of a, a flow do you get in, in your shop? Do you, is it a, yeah, describe it for me. I, everybody has a different... Uh, story about how their shop works. So, well, like I say, it's our warehouse open to the public. So when no one's around, we're putting things online. I'm either packing or unpacking from a show. Uh, my wife is getting orders off the internet, and she does the wrapping of the books and the shipping. I'm hmm. um, going on what they call house calls. Yeah. And um, I've purchased libraries around the country and just had them shipped back to my warehouse. That's one of the benefits. I have a loading dock. Yeah. You have space. In space, so I bought a big library in Florida and just had Roadway deliver it back to Buffalo. Just when you get to it, you get to it. Well, yeah, that's, that's about it. And, and the future is when we see that there's not very much participation with the walk-in shop, we will vacate the first floor and lease it out, and then we will be upstairs, open by appointment, and then focusing more and more on the Internet, which is the way I see things going. Yeah. What percentage of your business now is, for example, on the internet, uh, from people coming into your shop, from from your auction um, experience. It just you don't have to. Well, fear. I mean, it's about 35 percent walk-in, 35 uh, percent shows, and uh, the rest is divided between the uh, internet and the auctions. Because mm -hmm. they're unpredictable. I mean, oh, you can course. go gangbusters, or you can get no orders mm -hmm. at all. Okay. Um, what aspects of the book trade have changed for you since the Internet? Um, well, let me see. Let me think, <laughs> if I can think. Uh, of course you can think. Uh, what aspects of the book trade have changed? Um, well, what I think has changed is people are now uh, cross-examining, so to speak, book dealers. They'll come to a show and see a book and they go, well, let me think about it. Well, actually what they do is go and research that book and find out a little bit more about it. And uh, so this can be good or bad. I mean, if they find out that the book's worth more than what you're asking, they'll come back and buy it. If it's worth less, then uh, they might do something else. Yeah. So that has changed. Do you find, like most booksellers have said, that it's sort of like a race to the bottom with a certain area of the book. Well, it, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but, you know, uh, I draw a line. I'm not out to compete with 
uh, every charity or every uh, uh, company that, uh, that doesn't have expenses. What we do is we provide a service. So you come in as a customer, we, we go to work for you. You say, look, I'm interested in collecting cookbooks before 1850. I'm out there looking for you. I'm your agent. I'm doing work for you, even though I haven't found anything yet, but eventually I will. So that's possible. a service. So we're providing a service which is uh, um, worth something. So naturally, we're not going to say, well, there's a copy online for 50 cents. Well, so be it. Mm. Uh, we have to let the chips fall where they may. If you want to stick with us and have us go to work for you and also advise you whether to buy or not to buy, those are some of the things that ABAA dealers provide to their customers. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, if you were entering the book trade today, Ron, uh, part, part one of the question would be, would you? Part two of the question would be, how would you do it in this, in this economy, in this day and age? Well, there you go. Um, uh, what I found myself doing in the 80s and 90s, uh, I'm from Buffalo, and uh, we had, used to have steel plants and automobile plants, yeah. and a lot of those uh, uh, went down and were changed. And I found a lot of people would be calling me up, say, look, we're moving, uh, we have to move, we have books, and do you want to buy them? And I had opportunities to buy, and so I needed a warehouse. I went out and rented a warehouse, a huge warehouse, 6,000 feet, and packed it full of books, of libraries. I was buying collections so fast, I couldn't even look through them hardly. Wow. I just store them for a future. And um, um, then I got the idea, why don't I look into buying my own warehouse? Because one of the warehouses I was in, they called me up and said, look, we sold this property, we're going to build a drugstore here, you have to get out, you've got three months. And I went through all that agony of moving, and wow. <clears throat> I said, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to try to buy a warehouse. I got a four-story building, and I rehabbed it. My wife suggested we move into the warehouse our old store now we lease out. So the money from that lease and the money we saved from running the warehouse, we only had to add about $1,500 a month to make the mortgage make for work. this new place. So we did that well, and it's great. working. Well, that's, that's great. So yeah. I would say you'd have to approach it that way. Uh, I've told a couple of friends of mine, you know, get yourself a little property. You can live upstairs or mm -hmm. rent it out and have your books earned. And no one's gonna come and say, hey buddy, you gotta move. That's, that's absolutely right. You know, you know what I mean by that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're moving this week, so. Oh, God, so there you go. <laughs> you, know what, you know what I'm talking about. Um, we look around and we see ourselves as booksellers. Uh, we've been around a while, and now we're in the 2000s. What do you see as some of the challenges that, that bookselling is going to face in the, in the years to come? Well, probably we won't be around much longer, but there's going to be a generation of booksellers that are going to be faced with issues we probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have been faced with when we started. Well, it's the same thing what we had to learn when we broke into the business. We had to learn the nature of the business and how it is, and all it is is there's new rules for the game. It's not just us, it's everybody else in the country, no matter what business you're in. If you're selling other products, other commodities. You have, you have your competition, you have people, different methods of advertising. Uh, I think the book business will survive. It, this is a hobby, and, and what it is, is I think, is one of the most wonderful hobbies in the world, collecting books. I feel sorry for people who don't know the joy, the pleasure of this hobby of collecting wonderful books mm -hmm. and, and keeping them and enjoying them and taking care of them and passing them on to your family. But outside of that, uh, uh, people are going to have to adapt to the modern ways of doing things. But I think the book business will survive because uh, I see nothing wrong with book dealers walking around with a Kindle. Mm -hmm. Because if you're on a flight or if you want to just relax, and they have them now with larger print so you can read. Yeah. You can still read even though you can't read. You know, you have to have these things to read the fine print. Well, so a Kindle can be very, it's a tool. Yeah. I don't think it's going to bring down and eliminate our hobby of preserving and collecting uh, heritage. What do you think about uh, some of these people like Nabu and Kessinger who are reprinting things faster than you can say you know, anything? It's just unbelievable. This is capitalism gone wild. Um, I think they've overextended themselves. 
uh, they're trying to jump on a bandwagon. Um, I think they're going to find that uh, um, it's not going to be as productive as they think. I've seen many of these uh, print-on-demand books. They're double or more than what you can get the original book for. Now, I've noticed, and, and the reproduction of the plates and the maps are just awful. Terrible reproductions. I, I, I bought a Civil War collection recently, and the guy had lots of these print-on-demand books with binders. But I say, who would want to buy this? Who would want to own this? This is if you, it's essential information that you can get either off the computer or you can have print on, but the print on demand, I don't see it. I, I don't see it as a collectible, certainly. No, it just, it just seems that every time you, you look on a, a list of books on the internet, there there are 90% of them are, are exactly. print on demand. So. And I find that to be really out of proportion. I, I don't know Tr where totally. they're going with that. I don't know what they're trying to do. Um, but what I think we have to do is focus on getting younger people and introducing to them the wonders of our hobby. As a matter of fact, I'd like to see the ABAA uh, even have little seminars in various cities at schools where they bring people, they bring a local ABAA dealer in and give a little talk and show them, guess what this is? This is, this is a miniature book. How many people have ever seen a miniature book? Okay, this is an old Bible. This is what these things are. And these things are available to be collected just like other kinds of antique items, objects of art. And uh, it's like saying, is reproduction paintings gonna knock the original painting market out of business? No, it's not. And I don't, I see the same, I, I see the correlation there with our books being art, and we're not gonna be knocked out, off our pedestal no matter what they do. They can try, but I don't think they're gonna succeed. I hope they don't succeed. You mentioned uh, in a, a few sentences ago about young young booksellers, yes. um, can you think of you know some of the young booksellers that we have right now? Who you think are going to be the bellwethers of the trade when guys like you and I aren't around anymore? I think so. I think what we have to do is start spotting talent. Like I've sponsored, you know, seven or eight folks, and they've all been young people. And I've said to them, you know, we'd uh, like to have you apply to the AB, and they go, Are you kidding me? I said, no, no, we think that you can make this step, and I'd like to encourage you to do it, and a lot of them have done it. Now, who are some of the ones that, uh, that you've... Uh, uh, well, Stu Lutz is one. Um, yeah, he's a good guy. Gary Austin. Of uh, course, Gary, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> mm. um, I'm trying to think back. I'm drawing a mental blank, but well, you know, it's, been, it's been a few years. We've, we've got some at, at our book fair here in Boston, Fellows like Brian Cassidy and Lauren Bear and uh, the, yeah, these, Jeff Bergman, I sponsor. Yeah, Jeff Bergman. Yeah, I, I mean these these are the guys that are going to have to carry the flag into the future. And they are. And Jeff told me he said, Ron, he said, when you first talked to me, he says I thought you were nuts. <laughs> he said I thought you were. Where's this guy coming from? And he said now he tells me he says I'm so grateful and appreciate. And that's what I think we want to do is keep our eyes out for young talent and. Uh, um, encourage people to go forward. Yeah, in the old days, uh, the people who worked for booksellers were encouraged to stay with those booksellers. Nowadays, I think we encourage them to get yeah. out on their own. Well, road. like Tom Mahoney did with me. After yeah. five years, he said, you're ready. And I said, ready for what? <laughs> he said, you're ready to have your own shop. And that was, I probably would, never would have had a shop if he didn't say if that. If he didn't give you the impetus to go out and do it. Yeah. He did. He gave, see, a lot of young people just need a little nudge to get started to say, maybe I can do this. Well, I'm, I'm sure they can. Uh, who are some, uh, what are some of the uh, good memories you have of your early days in the trade? Some, some particular uh, good buy you made, some bad buy you made, uh, some person that, that you came across that had uh, an influence on you other than Tom. Uh, can you think a little bit about that? Well, you know, Walter Goldwater really was a wonderful man and a great friend. I mean... He was your, he was your main mentor? Yeah, we, we became close. He'd invite me home to dinner with his wife who owned the cookbook shop. Yeah. And uh, just being around people like this who were so kind, you know? And sharing. Oh, yeah. And I, there's so many colleagues of mine that have been like that. Ed Bomsey and uh, uh, Tony Ramo helped me. And there's so many, and you, you're, you've been a, 
Uh, forget about me. Star Wars. <laughs> forget, about, forget about me. I'll have my day in the sun someday. <laughs> <laughs> um, we talk a little bit about the rising stars and, and, and things, but what do you see uh, from your personal perspective, the future of book fairs, whether they be regional or national or international? Do you see them as a, as a going entity or do you see them shrinking? Well, unfortunately, I think that we're um, uh, concerned about shrinking, but I'd like to see expansion. Uh, I'm very gung-ho on the ABAA and more fairs. Um, I used to do the Chicago Fair. It was wonderful, and it was very sad to lose that. Yeah. I've heard talk that Atlanta might have a fair. Um, I did a couple of Washington fairs when they had them there. And um, um, I think we could support this market. For example, I do the Baltimore Antique Show, which has a book uh, segment to it. Oh, it. It's very successful. I mean, all of the dealers are thrilled with the results they get there. So we tied in with the antiques. And they bring in 30,000 people every year. Wow. And, uh, all these, and they put the book dealers in the middle of the antique show, so people are mingling through our aisles, and it's a four or five day show like New York, and it's, uh, uh, from my perspective, very successful. So we- 30,000 people is quite an amount of That's a tremendous crowd. Yeah, to go through a-, a And yeah. then it's a very high end antique show. I mean, for example, every year they sell paintings in the millions. They'll wow. say aisle five, a painting just sold for three million. Huh. I mean, so uh, I was there one year when a man came in and sold his whole booth for three million. The man wow. came in, how much for this booth? He said, you can have it for three and a half million. He said, I'll give you three. He said, I'll take it. It was all sculpture. Where is this man? <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I mean, it's amazing. There are just people walking around that you would not assume that they would do that. So we have untapped potential. I think the ABAA should uh, be a little more aggressive um, and we should expand. I think we should get out and meet the people. I mean, I think we should have uh, meet the ABAA in cities and schools and uh, volunteer ABAA members can go and give a talk just so people, young people will see they have no clue what this is all about. Have you suggested this to uh, anybody in, uh, at the ABAA? Your thoughts? No, I haven't. I'm suggesting it here today. Well, good. I, I wish you would put it in some writing and send it off to the, to the powers to be. We're going to get a new president of the ABAA this year, uh, John Thompson. And uh, I think he thinks well, same, along the same lines as you, as you do. He, he yeah, we, uh, John Spencer and I put on a symposium in Buffalo uh, about 10 years ago, and it was quite successful. John brought in some wonderful guest speakers, and uh, we did a tour uh, of the Roycroft, and we went to UB to see the Joyce Collection, which is the largest in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we... Uh, um, uh, had some entertainment and so it was very nice and a lot of people have asked us to redo it so um, I think we should have more events more symposiums and, like, uh, like what, you're, that, what you're describing yeah. yeah and what we need is a committee that looks into this well there is a there is a committee that does look into this and, and you need to give them their ideas but at the same time here we are at a book fair and there are events going on uh, with the book fair but are drawing people out of the book fair to those events. How do you see that? Well, I was impressed with the list of events that were put together. Um, uh, I think it can work if you look at the whole amount of time that people have to attend a book fair. They've mm -hmm. got the three days and they've got time and these seminars don't necessarily take more than a half hour or an right. hour. So, so I don't think they're hurting us. Okay. Uh, I think it's a good thing. I think somebody has made uh, a great effort to do this. Absolutely. And I was quite impressed, to tell you honestly. I think it's a good thing. Well, I think the, it, it, the book fair committees, uh, the various uh, uh, ABAA uh, try to do this kind of thing. They feel uh, that the more of this kind of uh, events along with the book fair, the more reason for people to come. Exactly. And, and that's a part of reaching out. I want to mention Doug Harding who I've known for many, many years. And uh, Doug always encouraged me and gave me a lot of encouragement. This is what younger people need uh, to, f you know, they walk around and think, well, I don't think I, 
good enough or I belong yeah, I, there. I've heard a lot of that. Yeah, and then just by just a few words of encouragement can uh, open up a whole window of opportunity. And I, I think it's the best thing that ever happened to me is my career as a bookseller, being a member of the ABAA. It, 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 it's and I want to thank all my colleagues and all the wonderful people, and I think we're doing a good thing, and uh, we're trying to make a living and pursue our hobby too as well. Yeah, I, I, uh, I always hearken back to uh, some of the, the early booksellers uh, who used to uh, keep things to themselves rather than sharing. And it's so good to live in an era where booksellers share with each other. We're starting to open comrades. up more. I mean, yeah. generally people are starting to open up more. And I, I They're not as reserved as they used to be. I think it's great for the trade. I think so. Mm -hmm. Well, Ron, I think we've come to the end of the line. And thanks very much. It's been a great interview and appreciate it.